Well, I'm going to share a message with you now that uh, may uh, stir within your feet that you want to go ahead and exit. <laughs> because it's a message dealing with something we all contend with, but sometimes uh, we don't necessarily want to be the answer or the solution. But I felt this so strong in my heart from the Lord. So it won't shock me if recently you've engaged in some, uh, the last 24 hours, relational conflict. Because God wants to uh, bring some direct counsel and wisdom and advice right to you about resolving relational conflicts. Have any of you in your journey in life experienced some relational conflict with someone else? Might you just raise your hand if that's been your reality? Oh, wow, there's a good number of you that haven't raised your hand. Well, don't worry, tomorrow's coming and you'll meet somebody. Oh, yes, you'll meet someone. Mean-spirited will stir something in you and you'll be in conflict. It may be a conflict in the context of your marriage. I feel the pain of that for some of you who are walking through a very, very difficult time in the context of your marriage. At Couples Week, and I really encourage you to go to. You'll get some great tools. If it's weak, God can make your marriage strong. If it's strong, he can make it even stronger. For, for some of you, as you navigate through this difficult season, there's been a splitting, a separation, even the potential of divorce. For some of you, it might be a friendship that just skewed off course, it's gone south, and it just, it pains your heart why this relationship has collapsed into where it's at. Maybe it's someone in the workplace Maybe it's a, a sibling. Maybe it's your mom or your dad, your grandparents. I don't know, but you know. You know where a relationship is severed. There's been a fragmentation. There's been a separation. There's a whole lot of hurt, not a whole lot of understanding, and you're wondering how in the world do you solve that? What would be God's requirement of you? Maybe as you peer back, it's maybe not the past couple days, but it's been decades that that relationship has been broken. There's a lot of pain. There's a lot of blame. There's a lot of mistakes that were made maybe on both sides or maybe just on their side. And you're trying to be as objective as possible. You don't know why. You don't understand. It's interesting that in our society, we're really not mentored or skilled We don't come under necessarily the tutelage of different individuals that help us go through resolving conflicts. You don't necessarily take a course in it. It's almost assumed in our society that you'll figure your way through this. It, it'll be difficult. You're in conflict with someone, but hopefully, eventually, it'll be resolved. Maybe you'll suppress it, or maybe you'll become combative and attack it head on. What does the Bible have to say? I mean, the Bible is so relevant, so practical. It expresses to us some really excellent tools and how to deal with relational, interpersonal conflict that could be at a minor level or a major level. You might be experiencing it right now, or as you reflect, as I share, God's going to bring someone to your mind that you say, wow, you know what? That's still unresolved. It's unsettled. And I still feel the pain of it in my heart, even though it's years ago. This is on your heart, God. I want to hear what you have to say to me. Now, that clash could be over an opinion or a view, your will, your desire, or theirs. And that clash can be, as, as I said, recent, and the intensity of the collision has just occurred in the last 24, 48 hours. Or maybe for you, it's months or years, decades old. The Bible says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation and has committed to us the message of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. Think of that. As a disciple of Christ, as a child of the living God, he has given you a potential that exceeds your own education, experience, or skills. He himself promises to give to you all the resources necessary to truly be a minister of reconciliation and to have the message of reconciliation. Now, contextually, we understand the immediate application of this verse has to do with the proclamation of the gospel. We understand that. God, through Christ, has come. We've been reconciled to the Lord. 
We have come into a connection, a restoration of our relationship with Almighty God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we become an agent, an instrument, an ambassador of communicating that to others. So we are called with the gospel to be ministers of reconciliation. And the message of reconciliation is the gospel. But I also believe when you extend the text a little further, it comes into application in our everyday life as well, interpersonally, when there's conflict with another individual and there's the desperate need for reconciliation, to be restored. And understand when the Bible speaks about reconciliation, it transcends and supersedes simply a resolution, a solving of a problem. Inherently built into it, it's pregnant with the desire to restore a relationship, not just remove a mistake or solve a problem. It pulsates with the restoration of a relationship. You see, when you even think of sharing the gospel, when you study the New Testament, you marvel at the fact that God so reaches to us wants us to be reconciled unto him through Christ. He sends his son that we could have a relationship with him and therefore be restored in our walk with God. And interestingly enough, you can take note of the fact, if I were to synthesize it down to an expression, God is definitely soul conscious and not as much sin conscious. That doesn't negate the Bible teaching us about sin. And I would never go soft on that reality, on sin. But the Lord's focus is on the human soul. I felt that one uh, afternoon when I was about to fly out, I was in the airport. Now I know the strength of our witness is primarily our life witness and then secondarily our verbal witness, but we need to proclaim the gospel, not only to live it out, And I also know that 85 to 90% of anyone who comes to Christ will come through a family member, friend, or work companion. So I know that's the relational capital that you draw from, that someone could look at your life, and then when you share who changed your life, it impacts them because they actually know you. So I get that. But I also know the Bible is replete with other examples of coming to a complete stranger and sharing the gospel with them. So I believe in both friendship evangelism and direct confrontational type of evangelism with a stranger. So as I was there, I felt prompted by the Lord to go to this gentleman. He was sitting there. He happened to be drinking at the time and it wasn't Coke or Sprite. It was an alcoholic beverage. And he was looking at a Playboy magazine. So I went up to him and I said, hey, listen, Um, I sat down next to him. Can I share with you about someone who absolutely radically changed my life? I mean, we're sitting here, we're waiting for the plane, but can I share with you? And he goes, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. What are you talking about? I said, just for a few moments, can I share with you about someone who radically transformed and changed my life? He said, is this uh, kind of the Jesus thing here happening? I said, yep, absolutely. Coming from my heart to yours. He goes, hey, look, man, look what I'm drinking. Look what I'm reading. I said, I don't care about that. I want to talk to you. You see, he knew immediately, hey, if you're a Christian, this is going to disturb you because he assumed most Christians are sin conscious, not soul conscious. Now, he wouldn't articulate it that way, but I knew what was happening in his heart. But that's the heartbeat of God. He's re- Does he have to address sin? Yeah, just like a physician has to address a disease, but his goal is to bring health. So I don't minimize the tremendous importance of Holy Scripture says about sin because it's sin that splits us and separates us and fragments our life. It's the disease that, that causes decay and destruction. So God is going to address sin in your life and in mine. But his focus is his love for you and me, your soul, your life. And so when you talk about reconciliation. You get that beating in your heart, you realize, wow, this is more than just solving a problem. Suppressing it or bringing it to the surface and getting into a fight over it. This is restoring a relationship. That's the ministry of reconciliation with the power of the gospel and interpersonally among us with one another. The restoring of a relationship. Can God do it? 
God can perform a miracle. Yes, he can. I understand there might be some individuals that you've tried very hard. Some of the things I'm going to share with you, I'm going to give you some of the most practical advice that I can possibly give to you about trying to restore a broken relationship. But I realize even if you bring all that to the table and your dependence is upon the Lord and you acknowledge I'm a minister of reconciliation, I'm going to carry the message of reconciliation, I'm going to be a peacemaker to seek to join and connect this broken situation, you might reach with everything in you, and I've done that with some individuals, and it still has not resulted in anything restorative in the relationship. I understand that. But this is what God holds you and me responsible for. Your life, your choices, the column. If it were a mathematical equation, it's in this column, you are to bring 100%. I mean, you need to be purposeful, intentional, tenacious. Everything in you says, I want to see this restored. Lord, grant me your strategy, grant me your wisdom, grant me your direction, but I want to see this restored. I'm engaging not just my mind, but my heart. And I'm not just doing this to prove I was right and they were wrong. I want this relationship restored. You give 100% to that. Here's where you cannot be passive, apathetic, or lazy if you're reflecting the heart of God. I'm going to pursue this. You bring 100, but it might be times in that mathematical equation, zero. The end result, zero. You can walk away disappointed, or you can say, Lord, I did everything that you called me to do. 100%. They have given no response, no feedback. They don't want it at all. They've actually spit upon my desire, my hope. That's the zero. I can't control that. I can't manipulate that. I can't superimpose my will upon it. And I'm not going to suppress the reality of what their choices are. But what you hold me accountable for is my column. And I'm going to put 100% in there. Everything in me. And even if it's time zero and equals zero, I'm still doing it with everything in me. Now, I hope, though, for some, there'll be a miracle and there'll be a wonderful response. God's bringing possibly one or two or several people to your mind. He's not doing that to mock you, belittle you, or torment you. He's saying, I want to bring you to a place of seeing how the ministry of reconciliation and the me message of reconciliation can flow through your life. You see, when forgiveness is given expressed, released. It will focus upon the offense, rightfully so. Forgiveness is sacred. It's extremely important. So even if the person that I might be in conflict with doesn't ask me to forgive them, and the offense is deep and hurtful and real, nevertheless, I still am going to release my forgiveness upon them. That's why intrinsically built into the very derivation of the Greek word forgiveness means literally to release. So I'll make the choice to release them of the offense that they created in my heart and my life. Even if they didn't ask for forgiveness, I'm still going to release them. Because see, if I don't, then I am chained to that offense. And I'm actually chained to their response. Thereby, I'm controlled. It dictates to me. It mandates uh, a, a power over me that puts me into bondage. So that's why forgiveness is so important. Now, forgiveness, again, is dealing with the offense, the point of conflict in the context of the relationship. So I was offended. I, I was hurt. But I release my forgiveness. So I release the chain. Now, reconciliation focuses on the relationship. So I don't want to just stop there. My prayer is not only the releasing of the chain, but I want the removal of the wall. That's where I want to get to. As a minister of reconciliation, you're not satisfied with just the releasing of the chain so you're not controlled or dominated or ruled by the offense or the individual. And you're like, oh, I'm liberated, I'm free. Well, the heart of God is, no, I want more than just the release of a chain because I've expressed my forgiveness. I want the removal of the wall that is separating us. So you pursue that. And say, Lord, bring forth reconciliation. That there's a focus on this relationship that is being restored. I want that. I desire that. I long for that. Ephesians chapter 2, it speaks of Jesus. And it speaks of him having the title of peace. 
Not just he brings peace, but he is peace. It's interesting that in the, the Tanakh or the Torah, our Old Testament, it really doesn't describe God as having that as a title, peace. But in the Talmud, among the rabbis, in their interpretation of the Torah and the Tanakh, which is our Old Testament, they say, oh, a rightful title that should be given to God is peace. The Talmud declares it. The New Testament reveals it. Jesus brings peace. And in Ephesians 2, it talks about reconciliation. You know what it also speaks about? It says, and he brought down the wall. The reference point there is in the ancient temple of the first century before it's destroyed in 70 AD under Titus, the temple itself had a wall that separated the Gentiles from the Jews. It was called the wall of separation, separating the court of the Gentiles from the temple proper where the Jews could be. And so the apostle Paul is making a prophetic declaration Jesus Christ came as the Prince of Peace to bring the wall down as well. To bring the wall down. See, my prayer when I'm in a conflict with a person is I don't want to just say, well, I forgive them. I release it so there's no chain from me connected to that that is going to control me. But my prayer is I don't want just the release of the chain. I want the removal of the wall. Show me, Lord, how to do that, how to press in through your power. Now there's a walls of separation, can be a legion, could be thousands. Misinformation, non-information, misunderstanding, judgments, offenses, toxic emotion, distortions, lies. We know there's all different kinds of walls that separate us from that other person. You can form an immediate conclusion. Most of us interpersonally will draw upon not actual facts, but what we call inferences. An inference is a statement about the unknown based on the known. So you say, oh, that person's wearing red. That's the fact. Then your conclusion, your inference is they're wearing red because they're very uh, bold and bombastic and extroverted and they want attention. So you, you form conclusions rapidly based on little pieces of information. It creates walls. It creates tension and conflict. Direct lies, distortions misinformation or non-information. You just don't have any information at all. You render judgments and these walls the Lord wants to bring down. Listen to a title that is given to those who are his sons and daughters. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of God. Those who turn walls by pressing in and causing them to become a bridge because of the impetus of the Spirit of God. And what's engendered in you is the wisdom and the strength to turn a wall into a bridge. In Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus speaks about the Beatitudes, there's eight of them. Very interesting. This is the only one that is given that says, this is where you'll resemble me. Oh, if, you, you know, if you're merciful, you'll receive mercy. If you're in sorrow, you'll receive comfort. If you're meek, you'll inherit the, the earth. But this is the one he says, but when you do this, when you're a peacemaker, that's when you look like me. That's when you reflect me. Blessed are the peacemakers. They're going to be called the children of God. You're going to reflect me, resemble me, look just like me when you purpose to be a peacemaker. And a peacemaker isn't someone who is passive or a pacifist. It isn't someone who suppresses the intensity of the conflict, burying it. It's, no, it's an individual who sees it straight up and the reality of it, but appeals to a higher reality of God's direct intervention to restore a relationship. And you become an agent and an instrument for that. When you say, I'm a peacemaker, I want to walk in that. Actually, the word peace, erine, in the Greek language of the New Testament means to join together or connect. So when you're a peacemaker, you're taking th two things that are disconnected and joining them together. How, pastor? It could be very intense. Well, God will give you wisdom. And in a moment, I want to give you very rapidly six particular things that I'll try to do when I'm in a difficult season of being in a conflict with a person or several. In ministry, for over 45 years, you can imagine the number of individuals 
that I could potentially be in conflict with. And I've, I've learned, boy, I'm not going to be embittered by this, unforgiving by this. I'm not just going to try to solve a problem. I want you, God, to show me how to be a minister of reconciliation, a messenger of reconciliation, to be a peacemaker that I could reflect and resemble you. Now, is it important to the Lord? Is this important to the Lord? If I haven't convinced you already or the pain on the inside hasn't convinced you already, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 23 through 24. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember your brother or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there in the front of the altar. First go. Can we say that together? First go. Can you say it like you're awake? <laughs> I get that horrible feeling like you're all asleep on me here. Can I tell you a story real quick? No, I won't. I'll tell you next time. I'll tell you real quick. I walked by one of my professor's classes, Dr. Charles Farah. Uh, he would teach uh, systematic theology one, two, three, and four. I wasn't in that particular class. And I walked by and I took note. I looked in there. And because it was a graduate level, there was maybe about 15 students. Five of them were sound asleep because he was reading from his lecture. His, his method, his didactic method was just to read. I decided to come back about five minutes later and about... Yeah, about 11 of them were asleep. I came back again. The, the, honest, before the Lord, I would not lie to you in church or anywhere. They were all asleep. Every one of them, all sitting down. Da, da, every one of them. And I looked at the desk. Do you know who also fell asleep? <laughs> honest, Dr. Charles Farah. He, he was down like that, just like this. Man, that's what you get in seminary, man. That's why I'm fired up. It's the kind of stuff. Okay, that was a tangent. True story, though. I should have taken a picture to prove it to everyone. It was a sight to behold. First go. And if you're not motivated by that, by Jesus himself, you know there's a pain on the inside when you're in conflict with someone. Uh, in one of our uh, chapters this summer during the sabbatical, we went to Italy, Florence, Italy. To be completely disconnected, it was kind of the, the study part of the sabbatical. And uh, when we were there, we were having to take a train from Florence to Rome. And Diane has a command of the language. She's great. I don't know what they're all saying, even though I was reared Italian. I don't have any idea. Um, but we had to get up on the train, and uh, we had one big suitcase. 1% of it was mine. 99% of what was in there was Diane's. And it was heavy. So I decided to be the macho, you know, the bravado moment. So I grabbed it. And I lifted it. Oh, oh, oh. And I didn't know till we returned. It was, I was in pain ever after that. And then through the month of August, uh, when we returned, we went to Pennsylvania. Uh, went and got an MRI. And uh, the orthopedic surgeon said, oh, your tendon, torn. What? Torn. So it's going to self-remedy. He goes, nope, 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 nope. Got to have surgery. I said, I don't want surgery. So well, then it's not going to be repaired. This is the tendon. The tendon connects a muscle to a bone. So you got the bone, you got the muscle, and you need the tendon. And mine is not, not frayed, it's there. Separated. That's why some of you, you may have formed this conclusion. Wow, Pastor Z, he came back from his sabbatical, and I know before that he used to hug us. Now he doesn't hug us. See, now your inference, he doesn't like us anymore. No, I've got this. Some of you have hugged me, and it's, you've hurt me. <laughs> so I decided, let me just tell everybody publicly, until I have the surgery, please don't hug me. I'm not hugging you. It has nothing to do with my love for you or your love for me, okay? No inference here. It's that I tore this tendon. So there's constant pain. Now, that's the picture of a relationship that has been split, separated, divided. You're going to have that constant pain on the inside. And you kind of hope, well, won't it kind of naturally resolve itself like I'm hoping? No, you're going to need surgery. You're going to need input. You're going to need to step forward. You may need to get some others helping you along the way to bring forth what is such a priority to Christ. What are the six keys? This is going to take us six hours. No, don't get scared. I'm too hungry. I'm going to be done in this in seven minutes anyway. Six keys to resolving relational. Let me say the first one. This is what I purpose to do, to walk in humility. That can be difficult. That can be a real fight because, why? Because you may have done absolutely nothing wrong. Truly nothing wrong. 
and you purpose to walk in humility because there's a promise there. It comes from this passage here, James 4, 6. God gives grace to the humble. That's repeated again in 1 Peter 5. And it comes from Proverbs 3. Three times it's repeated in the Old and New Testament to us. God gives grace to the humble. I need your grace, Lord, for this person, for myself in this situation. I need your empowering presence to help me, assist me, aid me in this difficult situation. So I want to walk in humility. There's something about bending for mending. You see, the, the derivation, the etymology of the word humble in the Greek New Testament means literally to go low. That's why in the ancient church, they, just, they would pray going to their knees because it was an expression of going low, a breaking of one's will to submit to God. So that became a practice in the ancient church, traditions of praying on your knees. You see it in the New Testament as well as the practice of the ancient church because it was going low. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 says, listen, when someone has done you wrong, they've maligned you, they've hurt you, there's a conflict in the relationship because of something that other person has done, Jesus tells us this is what you got to do. Ready? Pray for them. Pray for them. So an expression, a concrete expression of walking in humility, this is what I do. I'm trying to put handles on this. This is what I do. And the, I believe the Bible teaches us to do it. I begin to pray for that person. Now at first, your prayer might go something like this. Okay, this is me now. And there's Jesus, okay, and I'm going to talk to him. And you might go before him and say, Jesus, you told me, you know, I, I, I want to walk in humility. And so I want to, you know, bend my heart before you. I'm going to fulfill what you said in Matthew 5:44. I'm going to pray for this person. So let, let me talk to you about this person. Man, you know they are a pain. And they have, they've done me wrong. And I've made no mistakes in this whole equation. So let's deal with them. You're a God of mercy, but you're also a God of judgment. And you're, you're a God of heaven, but you're a God of hell. And please deal with this person. Yes, I bore my heart to you, Lord. Do, what, do whatever you need to do, but do it, do it, do it to them. Have you ever prayed that way? Come on, don't lie in church. Yeah. Then you get the God moment when you're talking to him and all of a sudden, Gary, come on. And then I realize, oh Lord, then I go to my knees. Then I realize, oh Lord, in my bending, let there be a mending of this relationship. Forgive me. First and foremost, let them be reconciled to you more than even being reconciled to me. You love them. Help me to, to feel their pain and their hurt and help me to be objective, Lord. I pray for them. Let them be reconciled to you. Move upon their life. It's such a different heart and prayer. And the beauty of it is when you go down, that allows God to have direct impact on them. Direct impact on them. When you're praying the way I have prayed before, you're in the way. He's got to work on you. Man, what's, and you go down. You watch how your life changes, and you watch what the Lord does over your life. Walk in humility in prayer. Secondly, recognize your limitations. The scripture says, why do you see the piece of sawdust in another's eye and not notice the wooden beam in your own? There's times when I'm, I'm convinced they are completely wrong and I'm completely right, but I need to talk with others that are going to be objective. You don't like that at first. I don't. When I start telling, bearing my, and they say, well, wait a second. Why did you say it that way? Why are you looking at me? Let's just agree with me that they're wrong and I'm okay. But once you bust through that and you know that you're talking to someone who really loves you, and they're willing to correct you or challenge you, objectivity is brought into the equation. Do that with someone. Do it with the Lord and do it with someone so that you'd recognize your limitations, maybe your presuppositions, your preconceived ideas, maybe some inferences or value judgments that you've made that have contributed to it. And even though for you might be one mistake and they got 25, at least be willing to say, okay, I acknowledge that. Lord, take that out of my eye so I can see more clearly. Then listen. Listen to their emotions. Listen to their hurt. This one's sometimes very difficult for me because I tend, I can be very logical and analytical in an exchange. And so I'm just, I'm just parsing the words. 
And I, ha I have to intentionally step back and say, help me, Lord. I got to feel this person's pain. I got to feel their hurt in this conversation. Because in, in the Pragmatics of Communication, that's a particular book that's been written, the, the whole issue of a dialogue interpersonally, people only remember 10% of the words that you implement and employ. 90% is their, the, the emotions, the intonations, the inflections. So you have to stop and heed the scripture it says in James 1.19, let every person be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. You say, that's kind of my mode of operating. I can control the situation if I get angry, raise my voice. Well, this is say, Lord, I got to get this under the blood. Change that in my life. That's a destructive anger. There can be a constructive anger where you're wanting to move someone along with intensity and passion. But there's a destructive anger where you're trying to manipulate and suppress human will because you're getting angry. And maybe you're witty. Maybe you're quick on your feet and your logic is there and you could just burn through it. Man, step back. Say, God, help me to walk in humility, to recognize my limitations, and to listen to their emotions and listen to their feelings, to listen more than just to their words to feel their hurt. Extremely important. Sincerely then acknowledge your mistake. This is a hard one to do if, you're, if that person's at least willing to talk with you. It's where you step forward and say, I want you to know I recognize this as being more objective. I made a mistake here. But don't precondition it. Because you, you, you know, you've, you've made two mistakes, but you know they've made 25. So when you go, you're like, okay, listen, uh, Pastor Z told me to do this. I'm going to do this with you. I made a mistake with this and this. And they just stand there looking at you like, yeah, you're right. And you're like, oh, no, 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 come on now. You got 22 mistakes that you need to acknowledge. Come on, come on. And they're like, no. It's just, it's disingenuous. So before you ever have that encounter, you got to be willing to say, this is not conditioned on how they react or respond. I'm just going to bring to the table my heart and say, I'm sorry for that. They may not even forgive you. Many that, I've done that. I knew I made one mistake and they made about 30. And I did that and they smile and say, well, I forgive you. That's it? You forgive me. You forgive me. Oh boy. So it takes a while to get there. Does it? Okay, you guys are somewhat with me. I'll move faster now. Ask God for wise, practical strategy. You may have exhausted yours. Turn to him. I ask him, Lord, please give me a strategy. This isn't working. Maybe the person doesn't even want to meet with you. There's a particular individual that for me and Diane, the person doesn't even want to talk with us. We have reached and reached and reached that we're doing the 100%, but it's time zero. Very heartbreaking. But you ask God, God, what's the strategy? And he's been giving us a strategy. You're doing it in prayer and then in certain things. Ask him for that. If you lack wisdom, acknowledge that. He'll give you a strategy. Please hear me. Don't let that just, just land and glide off your head and your heart. He'll give you a strategy if you ask him. You might say, this is impossible. I've attempted it. Emails, text messages, phone calls. They don't respond. They don't return. And they're, they're so wrong and I feel so right. I, I, let's stop this conversation, Pastor. Ask him, grant me wisdom, Lord. Focus on working toward the agreement. I mean, that's where you want to go, not just settling an argument. You want to work toward the solution, not the problem. 38 years ago, Diane and I have been married 38 years, but 39 years ago, when we received counsel, the counselor said to us, uh, I said, okay, can you give us some good practical piece of advice? He said, well, one of the first things I want to tell you is my wife and I have been married 40 years and we've never had an argument. I thought, oh, wow, this is great. He lives in La La Land or something because Diane and I have had several arguments in our engagement. So he looked at me and said, I know you look cynical and skeptical. I said, I am, I do. You had to have some argument in 40 years, uh, unless one of you are dead. I'm sorry, did your wife die or at the beginning of the marriage or something like that? He said, no, and this is, this is what he said. He goes, we have never argued, but we've had plenty of opportunities to work toward agreement. Now, first I thought it was semantics, but then he was saying, that's your focus. If you focus on we're having an argument, we have a problem versus we're going to get to the solution. We're going to work toward agreement. That has helped us so much. Diane has had to work really hard working toward <laughs> agreement. 
Lastly, speak with a uh, worship team. You could come on up. Speak with love-filled truth. Do you know this? Hear me. You can speak the truth in rejection. You can be arrogant about it, self-righteous. You just spoke a word of truth, but you could do it with rejection. God forbid. But to speak the truth in love is you're reaching. You don't want the wall. You want a bridge. That's the heart of God. Jesus could have come and spoke the truth in rejection, but he came and he spoke truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. I'm going to tell you the truth, but I want to speak it in love. There's a big difference. You might say, okay, how do I do that, Pastor? Is that, do I make the conversation real syrupy and sugary? No, I think you should do this. This is what I'll do. If I want to speak the truth to that person in love, I'm going to look for the most conducive environment to do it, the right time to do it, and how I say it so that it's palatable and they're receptive to it. That's the in love. You're making a choice. So you might say, well, you know what? We need to get this resolved. We're going to do it now, and we're going to do it here, and we're going to do it my way. Hey, you know, that's, that's speaking truth and rejection. If you say, you know what? When's the best time where that person is going to be the most receptive? Because timing is very significant in the resolving of a conflict relationally. When is the best time? Not for me, for them. Where's the best place to do this? In a public setting where they'd be embarrassed or privately? Or What's the best where for them? That's love speaking now. Not for you, for them. How do I say it? where it doesn't put the blame. How do I say it where it's palatable and they can eat it without compromise, but speaking the truth in love. When do I do it, Lord, where they're ready and the where and the how? Because love is patient, it's kind, it's not proud, it does not dishonor others. Because what I want to be, Lord, I want to be a peacemaker to resemble you and reflect you. Can we all stand together? I believe the altar response right now is just for you to close your eyes and say to the Lord, Lord, I'm open. This was obviously on your heart and on your agenda. You placed it on pastor's heart by the Spirit. I know he did. And with your eyes closed, it was just me and you in this room. I know God is saying to you, he, he's called you, he's called you to be a minister of reconciliation with a message of reconciliation. To be his son and daughter as a peacemaker, to reflect him and resemble him and to look just like him. And the way Jesus reached out to me, to you, I don't know about you, but for me, my back was to him. I didn't want him. I was rejecting. And I even had some things that I, I wasn't happy with him about, that I was going to complain. The blame was on God. God made the mistakes, not me. But you know what he did? He still reached to me. He wanted me to be reconciled to him. Maybe that person's giving you their back. Maybe they define you as the, as the problem. Say, Lord, I want to be a peacemaker. I want to reach. I don't want to just release a chain. I want to remove a wall. Help me to do this, Lord, by your grace. Help me to walk in humility. Help me to acknowledge where I've made a mistake, to recognize my limitations. And right now, I ask you, God, show me your strategy. Reveal it to me. Help me to to feel and to listen to their pain and to their hurt. Help me to pray, really, to pray for them on my knees in a position of brokenness. And then, Lord, help me to know when and where and how to speak the truth in love. Please help me, God, with this.
the hurt is deep, the pain is real, and that person could be blamed for it all, I get it. But just ask him now, help me, Lord. Help me. This is on your heart. This is a sacred moment. Be a minister, a reconciliation, a peacemaker. He's built you with his presence to be able to do it. Father, we thank you for your presence that is in this place. So you will empower us to be ministers of reconciliation and peacemakers. Attributes that come from you that flow right into our life because we're born again. And where those dry bones are, those dead, broken relationships are, you'll bring life. And may the blessing of Almighty God be upon you. May you go forth with a new faith and trust that he, the great reconciler, is in you. And he'll give you the strategy, the wisdom, the strength, the grace, and the ability. I pray this blessing on you in Jesus' name. So let it be upon you. Would you say, I receive this. God bless you. Give an embrace to one another.